This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. People can trust that these vaccines are safe to use. And I, I hope that people trust um, the vaccine um, and, and, and will take it up and see for themselves the effect it has. That's Dr. Kathy Iwar at the Jenner Institute, University of Oxford, on Ghana, becoming the first country to approve a new malaria vaccine. Details coming up. Also, Sudan's military warns of potential clashes with the powerful RSF paramilitary force. Flooding displaces thousands of families in Burundi. And a seven-story building under construction in Nigeria collapses. These stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Sudanese in the capital, Khartoum, and other cities across the country woke up today to a dramatic escalation in tensions between Sudan's armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces, RSF. In a televised report, Army spokesperson Brigadier Nabil Abdullah said, recent RSF deployments in Khartoum and other cities have stirred up panic and fear among people. VOA's Nabil Biagio reports. Army spokesperson Nabil Abdullah told reporters in Khartoum last night the military did not approve the Rapid Support Forces' recent deployments in Sudan. According to the constitution and law, it is the responsibility of the Sudanese armed forces to maintain the security and safety of the country in cooperation with various state agencies, and the laws have organized this cooperation. Accordingly, we must push the alarm button because the country is passing a historic and dangerous curve and the risk increases with the rapid support forces by mobilizing forces and spreading up inside the capital, Khartoum, and some cities. Abdullah said the army has tried to find an amicable solution to its dispute with the RSF but warned the situation risks an outright war. The dispute between the RSF and national forces was exacerbated by talks to create a transitional government to eventually hold elections and put a civilian administration in place. The armed forces kept on in finding peaceful solution to these violations, to keep it peaceful in general, and an unwillingness of an armed conflict that can destroy everything because all of these foresee incursions and redeployment is not one of the systems or duties of the rapid support forces and its work. It is in an obvious violation of the law and it's against the security committee's instructions. Abdullah said the recent deployments could worsen an already volatile political and security situation in Sudan. The military's statement came as the RSF deployed troops in River Nile State on the border with Egypt. Local media reported the force is attempting to build a base in the town of Meroe. The RSF responded by saying its presence in Meroe is in line with its operations and duties in all Sudan's states to maintain security and tranquility. The RSF's statement urged the public and the media not to pay mind to this information it said is meant to fuel the fire of sedition and undermine the country's peace and security. The statement concluded by threatening to sue entities it said propagate false news at the expense of the country's peace and security. The RSF is seen as allied with Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir, who was ousted by massive protests in 2019. Many people in the Darfur region know it as a deadly force formerly known as the Janjaweed, accused of committing atrocities during Bashir's three decades in power, especially in the Darfur region. For VOA News, I'm Nabil Biagio in Washington. The Sudanese military is warning of potential clashes with the powerful Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, paramilitary force. As we reported, the army says the RSF deployed troops in the capital and elsewhere across the country. Tensions between the military and RSF have been on the rise in recent months, causing delays in a UN-backed agreement between political parties to set the country back on a path towards democracy. Nasreen Al-Sayam, a young 
young pro-democracy activist in the capital Khartoum tells VOA's Carol Van Dam that loyalists to former President Omar al-Bashir were behind the request by a Sudanese man at a public gathering in Khartoum Tuesday night for a fatwa to assassinate Volker Perths, the UN Special Representative for Sudan, as well as recent tensions between the RSF and the Army Command. I think the most important message that they wanted to send is that we are coming back to the scene because they were off the scene for a long, long time. Um, I mean, the past three years. And um, I think they're just trying to make a big uh, a big uh, homecoming. When you say they, are you referring to the Bashir loyalists? Yes, yes. And when you say that they were off the scene for some time, do you mean while the, the sides were, you know, negotiating for this framework agreement? Yes, they thought after, especially after the coup, that they will be back and things will be in their favor. But now, especially with this uh, new agreement, uh, they notice that things are not coming back to them. They might be going to someone else, and not the, the, the same uh, transitional government, for example, not the same political parties, but at least not them too. And I think this is what made them worried. It is just uh, also a show. Uh, um, I mean, it's it's not something new for them. Uh, it's the way they communicate and it's the way they do things. Um, and assassination is their field of work. Uh, along of the 30 years where they ruled uh, Sudan, we had uh, many, many cases, uh, different people, different uh, places. And also uh, we have a lot of people that are still reported missing. We don't know if they are uh, were killed or not because there is no bodies. Um, so sometimes people just think they are dead somehow because this is how they do things. But for me also, a big part of the government, uh, the al-Bashir government, was on jihad. And they consider everyone who's coming outside the religion, who's coming outside the country, is a person that should be done jihad on which is absolutely doesn't actually fall with the same uh, Islam rules, nor the Sudanese norms and traditions. This group of people that you're saying attended the meeting, they're against the framework agreement. They have denounced the framework agreement, right? Yes, yes. Any agreement that doesn't guarantee the, the coming back of the previous regime, they are against because they are the previous regime. And to be honest with you, this is not the first gathering in the last uh, three, four months. They are coming back more aggressively, having more meetings, and they had the big iftar for Ramadan in Kober, which is the neighborhood where Amr Bashir grew up and where he is actually jailed right now um, a few days ago. Like big, big iftar. And the, a lot of money and resources are still in bidding to their organs, uh, and so they are still very much active. And even some people who were jailed and, and bailed out somehow after the coup um, are touring Sudan, doing a lot of public talks and gathering more people. And I know from many re uh, resources that they are actually trying to train, retrain and uh, uh, rearm like 500 from each state uh, to be able to come back, as they call it, the big coming back. That's uh, Nasreen El Sayem, a young pro-democracy activist in Sudan. She was speaking with my colleague Co uh, Carol Van Dam from Khartoum. Clashes between Arab and non-Arab groups in Sudan's Darfur region have left at least 24 people dead, dozens of homes burned, and thousands displaced. The French news agency AFP says the violence erupted Saturday in the town of Fort Banga, about 185 kilometers from Ganina, the capital of West Darfur state. Authorities have responded with a night curfew and a month-long state of emergency across the region. Security forces have been dispatched and the situation has reportedly calmed down. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says about 50 homes in the Foro Baranga area were burned and 4,000 families, about 20,000 people, have been displaced. Displaced. The UN says ethnic fighting last year in Sudan killed around 900 people and displaced almost 300,000. 
According to the Washington Post, a leaked U.S. intelligence document claims Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi recently ordered subordinates to produce up to 40,000 rockets to be covertly shipped to Russia. In the top-secret document, Sisi instructs the officials to keep the production and shipment of the rockets secret to avoid problems with the West. Egypt is one of America's closest allies in the Middle East and a major recipient of U.S. aid. David DeRoche, a professor at the Near East Center for Strategic Studies in the National Defense University, discussed these developments with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shanawi. It's important to know, first off, that the Egyptians have adamantly denied that this has happened. And I think that when they're so emphatic on something, that's usually a pretty good indication that the story is false, because if there were truth to it, it would come out and they would wind up looking bad. But if it does happen, it would be a very, very big miscalculation by Egypt. This is viewed by most of America's partners as an existential threat, This, at least European partners. It's viewed in the United States, which has great political divisions, but in general, opposing Putin's annexation of Ukraine is something that both parties agree on. And so the Egyptians have said this isn't true. And if it is true, it's a spectacular miscalculation on their part. In response to questions regarding the document and the veracity of the conversations, it described Ambassador Ahmed Abu Zaid, spokesperson for Egypt's foreign ministry, said that Egypt's position from the beginning is based on nonviolent in this crisis and committing to maintain equal distance with both sides while affirming Egypt's support of the UN Charter and the international law in the UN General Assembly resolutions. Would that reassure the United States? The way the United States views this, that a possession of neutrality is seen as taking sides with Russia. But I think that, you know, we understand that there are a number of countries who are doing that. I think that providing weapons to Russia would not be consistent with that statement. So if that is Egypt's policy, and if, as Egypt has said, that's the policy that they have adhered to, then that would be reassuring to the U.S. in, in this instant, in this moment. A U.S. government official speaking on the condition of anonymity to address sensitive information said, we are not aware of any execution of that plan, referring to the rocket export initiative. He added, we have not seen that happen. But Senator Chris Murphy, who serves on the Senate Foreign Relations and Appropriation Committees, said, If it is true that President Sisi is covertly building rockets for Russia that could be used in Ukraine, we need to have a serious reckoning about the state of our relations with Egypt. Do you expect a response from the U.S. Congress, even though the U.S. intelligence intercepted the conversation back in February? I think that there will be a request for information from Congress. I think this is an issue that Congress will have a very great interest in. Senator Murphy, for example, is is at the forefront of those seeking to examine and possibly scale back military assistance to many of our traditional partners in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. I think that you know the relationship with Egypt is always somewhat difficult. From the American perspective, the uh, military aid we provide to Egypt is a gift that we give out of the goodness of our hearts. The Egyptians feel that they've earned it. So there's a misunderstanding at the heart of that relationship. It is always stressed over issues of human rights and, you know, Egypt's role in the region. Egypt being neutral is seen as unsatisfactory by many in Congress. So I think that when the facts are known, if this is a false story, I think that will be a good thing for Egypt. But if there is any truth in it at all, I think that there are many people in Congress who are looking for an excuse to crack down on Egypt. And unfortunately, this will provide them with an excuse to do so. That was David DeRoche, a professor at the Near East Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shanawi. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. A severe drought in North Africa has left Tunisian farmers bracing for a poor harvest and possible risks for food security. 
The French news agency AFP says the lack of rainfall has killed off crops, a situation exacerbated by the depletion of water sources and caused by climate change. Last month, the government imposed emergency measures, including rationing of water for several uses, including irrigation. Some farmers complain costs also are high for seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, and wages. The Farming and Fishing Union, UTAP, is predicting this year's harvest will fall by two-thirds from last year. It's urging the government to announce a drought and state of water emergency as well as clear strategy to boost water reserves. Ghana has become the first country to approve a new malaria vaccine described as a world changer by scientists who developed it as at the University of Oxford. The mosquito spread parasitic disease kills more than 600,000 people every year. The majority are children in sub-Saharan Africa. Kent Bensa reports from Accra, Ghana. A statement issued Wednesday by Oxford University says its new malaria vaccine, called R21, has secured regulatory approval by Ghanaian officials for use in the age group at highest risk of death from malaria, children aged 5 to 36 months. Malaria is an endemic disease in Ghana. The West African Country's Health Service says it accounts for 38% of all outpatients, with the most vulnerable groups being children under 5 years of age. Dr. Katie Iwa, head of malaria immunology and professor of vaccine immunology at the Jenner Institute at the University of Oxford. We've tested a lot of vaccines and to be here now to have a vaccine that has been approved for, for use in Ghana is, is fantastic. It's what we've all been working very hard towards. So R21 has higher efficacy, um, about 75% in the data from the phase two trial. Um, We think perhaps the durability of the response is better as well. Ghana was one of three African countries in 2019 to have piloted the first malaria vaccine, known as RTSS. But public acceptance of the vaccine, according to health officials, was somewhat below target due to hesitancy among parents linked to a fear of the unknown. Iwa says having more malaria vaccines now on the market helps parents make a better choice. Having more than one vaccine available is a, is a really good thing. So I think it's good news that we've now got a second malaria vaccine approved. And so people can trust that these vaccines are safe to use. And I, I hope that people trust um, the vaccine um, and, and, and will take it up and see for themselves the effect it has. The World Health Organization says a child dies every minute from malaria in Africa, where it is estimated that 9 out of 10 malaria deaths occur. It is hoped that the new vaccine will help Ghanaian and African children combat malaria. Dr. Nana Yaupipra, the head of the National Malaria Control Program in Ghana, told VOA that the Oxford vaccine is coming at the right time. The vaccine has a role in the elimination agenda uh, because it reduces uh, the risk of people having the disease and also its severe form. And the vaccine are for children. If you allow your child to be given this vaccine, the risk of this child, which is actually in the vulnerable group, of the risk of getting malaria really reduces. Nearly half of the world's population is at risk of malaria. In 2020, an estimated 241 million people in 85 countries contracted malaria. That same year, the WHO says the disease claimed approximately 627,000 lives. Kent Mensah for VO News, Accra, Ghana. An official says a seven-story building under construction in Nigeria collapsed after a truck ran into it yesterday, trapping an unspecified number of workers. A reporter has more from Abuja, Nigeria. The 5 p.m. collapse on Banana Island, an artificial island off the coast of the capital, Lagos, was confirmed in a statement by the State Commissioner for Physical Planning and Urban Development. It said no fatalities were confirmed and those who sustained injuries are receiving treatment. Dr. Lufemi Oke Osayintolu, Permanent Secretary for Lagos State Emergency Management Agency, or LASEMA, also confirmed the incident. From the preliminary reports, 
and the eyewitness, and it was a um, several-story building that collapsed due to the fact that um, a truck rammed into the building. That is the preliminary report. But we are still going to carry out holistic investigations to what led to it. He urged members of the public to remain calm. The operation is still ongoing. We have our heavy duties on ground. We have our Charlie on ground. And steadily, slowly, we are going to ground zero. We are able to conduct the place off. We inform the workers to give way to us. Meanwhile, Lagos State Government said it is investigating what caused the unapproved structure to collapse. For VOA News, from Abuja, Nigeria. African entrepreneurs say financial technology is uh, addressing a range of challenges faced by the continent, among them access to quality health care and easy access to cash. Benjamin Fernandez is the co-founder and CEO of Nala, one of Africa's leading fintech companies that focuses on international money transfers. Wednesday, he sat down with VOA's Mike Hovey, where he unpacked why financial technology is the fastest growing industry on the continent and how entrepreneurs are circumventing infrastructural and policy challenges. It's a growing industry. I think payments across the continent is 1% built. I think there's so much more to be uh, coming, especially in the fintech space. Majority of the fintech funding that goes to Africa, the $5 billion that was invested last year was fintech. And I think that's just the beginning phase of what's going to happen. And the reason and rationale for why is most people don't start a business thinking they're going to be a fintech company. Like, like, let's say they're trying to enable hospitals to collect money for like, you know, and it's disaster because they can't do direct payments with a telecom or a bank in that country. Then they end up becoming a fintech company, solving that, then end up offering that as a service. I'm really excited about the potential for the quality of uh, companies that are going to be coming out across the continent over the next five to ten years. Fintech is arguably the fastest growing sector on the continent. Do you think the reason why it's growing is because it's addressing issues beyond just economy? Fintech, I think it covers so many sectors, as you've mentioned. But I think when central banks see money coming in, the movement of money, there's like more interest. Like, okay, cool. Like, how can this benefit our economy? How do we get more of that? Exactly. Like, what, how do we use fintech to increase global trade with our economies because if you really think about it like countries are trying to increase global trade because that's a source of revenue for them and like increase the quality of living increase better health care as well better education for people in the country so i think they're all tied together and i think, think fintech is a foundation for that uh, tell us more about your business so at nala we do cross-border payments from the united states the uk uh, 19 countries in europe to five countries in africa um, home market was tanzania which is where i'm from what we really try to focus on is how do we u- use technology to reduce the cost of cross-border trade and people who send money to africa but also trade with africa we're one of the larger remittance companies from the uk to africa if we try to reduce the cost for fx losses through technology um, in different markets that we operate in we recently got our payment service provider license in tanzania by the central Bank, uh, Bank of Tanzania, and this enables us to do inbound and outbound transactions within the region. Now, how important is it to have more of those on the continent? I think there's going to be, you know, 15 to 20 dollars built over the next five to 10 years, and I think it's a good thing. I think the more of us, the better, because at the end of the day, the, the customer wins. Why? Because we're all going to reduce price. We're all going to figure out and get, okay, well, like, what can we do? What else can we negotiate with banks, like creative ways for partnerships and so on? I think it's a good thing. And I think at the end of the, the businesses and the customers win. I really think that what's being built even in our space today has barely touched the surface for what's going to happen across the continent. How were you guys able to create a statistic story considering the challenges that we face on the continent? We're talking low internet access. We're talking infrastructure, ETC. How were you able to turn that around and still create a success story? I think Africa is a fascinating place to work. The way I look at things on the continent is... You know, this point of understanding, I think, is, is hard. People might say, like, African regulators are bad and this, this, and I'm like, no, guys, listen. Go and sit down with them. Go and understand what is the problem that they're concerned about, right? And then help shape the policy. Like, that's the opportunity and the responsibility we as fintech founders have across the continent. It's like, how are we enabling the next 50 or 100 founders coming be after us to be able to be successful in that ecosystem? Because the same challenges we face, we have a responsibility to the ecosystem to make it better for the next 100 people building their businesses. That was Benjamin Fernandez, the co-founder and CEO of Nala. He spoke to VOA's Mike Hove in Washington.
And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website 